Okay, so thanks everyone for uh, joining us again. Today we're very to have you, happy to have Yuming Cheng from Princeton, who's going to talk about his latest work on modular flow as a disentangler. So Yuming, thank you very much, and take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Yiming Chen, a graduate student from Princeton University. And today I'm going to talk about a paper which is based on uh, my work with Xi Dong and Aitor Lukwitz and Xiaoliang Xi. Okay, so let's start. First, I will uh, give a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I, uh, I will talk about some review and motivation, and then I will spend most of the time on the proposal and the evidence for our proposal. And then I'll discuss some simple examples, and then it's the summary, okay? So as I've watched some of the YouTube videos online, I, I assume that I'm talking to experts in the field, so I will just uh, give some simple review. So uh, our, our work will be uh, on the topic of entanglement entropy, and especially holographic entanglement entropy. So what is entanglement entropy? So in a quantum systems, the, entangle, the entanglement entropy of a subregion A is defined as the following. So you have a density matrix rho and you trace out the rest of the system to get the reduced density matrix rho A. And then you take this reduced density matrix to calculate the entropy. And in this talk, we will be extensively using words, including the word modular. So what, what do I mean exactly? We define the modular Hamiltonian of a subregion A as the following. So the modular Hamiltonian is the minus of the logarithm of reduced density matrix. So it is a Hermitian operator. And a modular flow is a unitary evolution using the modular Hamiltonian of A tensor product with the identity operator on the rest part of the system as the Hamiltonian. So you can see the definition here. So the unitary evolution is, the, uh, this unitary operator is simply e to the minus i k a times s. I will call this s as the modular flow parameter. You can also write it as rho a to the i s. And I will call the state that is modular evolved by this modular Hamiltonian as the modular evolved state, which is simply this rho s here, okay. So in holographic th theories, the entanglement entropy of a boundary region A is computed using the so-called HRT formula. So the formula states that the entanglement entropy of a boundary region A is calculated uh, as the, the area of the bulk extremal surface, which is homologous to A, divided by 4G Newton. So the correspondence between entanglement entropy and extremal surface is first proposed for the case of time independent or reflectional symmetric geometries as the so-called RT formula. In these situations, there is a special point, which is all the HRT surfaces of a constant time slice on the boundary lie in the same box slice. So you have this very special box slice here, which is the fixed point of the reflectional symmetry in the bulk. And another way to say is that for overlapping regions A and R, their HRT surfaces gamma A and gamma R intersected with each other. So in this figure, I draw a two plus one dimensional bulk and the boundary slice you know, is on a constant time slice on a circle. And then you take two overlapping regions A and R. And there, since their HRT surface will uh, lie in the same slice, they intersect with each other. So the intersection is in general a co-dimensional three surface in the bulk. So the discovery of the RT formula has led to many discussions of the relation between the entanglement structure in CFT and the spatial geometry in ADS. Here I say it is a spatial geometry is because that since all the HRT surfaces lie in the same slice, you are not actually probing the geometry in the time direction you are only probing the spatial geometry on that spatial slide, spatial slice, okay? So one interesting aspect of such discussion is that for such time reflectional symmetric state, the RT formula can, and also the subregion, subregion duality can be produced by such tensor network models. I think you are familiar with this kind of models and in the tensor network models, the boundary state is defined on the boundary of this tensor network here. 
And the RT formula is realized as the, you are trying, trying to find the uh, smallest cut that can separate two boundary regions. And that gives you the RT formula. However, uh, in general cases, for generic boundary states or for time-dependent block geometry, the HRT surfaces gamma A and gamma R, they do not intersect with each other. And thus, the consequence is that we cannot find a single box slice that fully describes the entanglement structure of the boundary state. So as you see in this, in this figure, I choose some special boundary state which is not defined on the constant time slice. But in this case, as you uh, choose these two boundary regions A and R, and they have some overlap here, you will see that in general, their HRT surfaces do not intersect with each other. And in this case, you cannot, uh, like what you did in the RT case, you cannot really find a box slice that contain both surfaces. Another way to phrase this is, uh, for generic cases, we cannot fully describe the entanglement structure of this state using a tensor network, at least in the simplest way. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, here they don't intersect because, because you're, I mean, in one higher dimension, you just miss them. Can one can pass over the other? Is that what you mean? Yes, yes. They can have some separation in the time time light direction. Right. right, but in this case, then you would imagine that this state would be described by a tensor network, which also is three dimensional instead of two dimensional. Yes, yes, yes. I think you can do that, but here I just mean you cannot use a tensor network which is only defined in like two dimension. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but, uh, that, that also assumes like a particular interpretation of the of the HRT surface in tensor network, right? Uh, I mean, yes, yes, yes. Because like the, the, basically what was drawn on the boundary is like just a uh, state that is time evolved in an inhomogeneous way uh, exactly. with respect to time, right? You can think, you can contemplate that, well, I, I can also draw a tensor network description of such time evolution. Uh, it's just okay, right? Exactly. So it would just be the points of the mirror and add some Euclidean's. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Or Lorentz's here, right? Lorentz's. Yeah. yeah, but I'm not sure that uh, the air chart surface is realized uh, exactly in, in that situation when you have a three dimensional tensor network. Oh, that okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay. So um, we can then ask what kind of boundary states allows a tensor network representation in the sense that I'm talking about. Uh, a, more, or, or, or a more specific question is, in what situation can we put two HRT surfaces, gamma A and gamma R, in the same Cauchy slice? And we are trying to answer this question using only the boundary quantities. Since, in general, the non-intersecting of two HRT surfaces, gamma A and gamma R, uh, is a reflection of the Bach dynamics. So we think that this is a modest step towards a better understanding of the emergence of space-time and especially the time part. Okay. So, uh, one uh -huh. uh, do you mean you want to put them in the same Cauchy slice for every choice of A and R? Or for a specific choice? Uh, if we can put them in the culture slice for every choice, then we can uh, use a tensor network to describe them. But here I'm only asking for a specific choice of A and R. Can we answer this question, whether they intersect? Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, before I discuss our proposal, I need to first discuss some definitions. So in the bulk, we define a new object called the constrained extremal surface. Uh, it is labeled by two index here. One is R and one is A. So A means that uh, the boundary region uh, that the constrained extremal surface should be homologous to. So this A is simply like the, uh, uh, the boundary region. So if you do not have this R here, gamma A will mean the HRT surface of uh, boundary region A. So what, what does this R mean here? Let's look at this definition. So I'm considering uh, a family of surfaces. They are extremal except across possible inter intersections with gamma R. So this set contains a family of surfaces. 
Um, let's compare this definition with the HRT service. So in the definition of the HRT service, the HRT service should be extreme or everywhere in the box. But here I, in, in fact, loosen the constraint. I, I de only demand the surface to be extremal, except uh, it can have some possible intersections with gamma R. And at that point, it can be, its derivative can be not continuous. So we do not demand it to be uh, extremal at that point. And we are supposed to find all the surfaces that satisfy this condition and find the minimal one. So the minimal, minimal one, we will call that as the constrained extremal surface. So uh, let's look at some cases where we can really look like uh, what the surface looks like. So there are two distinct cases. Uh, the first one is A and R do not overlap with each other. So as I drawn in this figure, I consider two non-overlapping boundary regions A and R. And we see that uh, since the boundary regions do not intersect, their edge hardy surface do not intersect. So you have some gamma A and gamma R here. So by this uh, by this definition, uh, what do this set contain? So it contains two families of surfaces. One is this gamma A. Because gamma A is extremal and it do not uh, intersect with gamma R. So it satisfies this definition, right? So gamma A is one of these uh, family of surfaces. And the other one is this uh, gamma that I draw here. So gamma is a piecewise extremal surface which extends from one boundary of A to gamma R and then from that point to the other boundary of A. So this is a piecewise extremal surface which also satisfies this condition. Now, uh, how do we find the constrained extremal surface? We are supposed to find the minimum uh, among all these surfaces. So now we need to use the properties of the HRT surface. So in general, the HRT surface, its area will be a uh, extremal, so its area will be a maximum in the time-like direction and minimum in the space-like direction. So here, because the gamma is in the space-like direction of gamma A, its area is greater than the area of gamma A. So by this definition, here we have this constrained extremal surface is just the extremal surface of A. So in this case, the uh, constrained extremal surface is trivial. However, in the other case that A and R has uh, non-zero overlap, and in general, their HRT surface do not intersect with each other. Again, you are trying to, uh, you are trying to find out all such surfaces and find the minimum of them. Uh, again, gamma A is uh, one of these surfaces, and you are also trying, uh, you, you can also find such, su such surface which is uh, extremely piecewise, so you, extend from one boundary of A to some points on gamma A, and then you extend from this point to the other boundary of A. So uh, now you, you are supposed to compare all the area of these surfaces and find the minimal one. Now, because uh, as I said, the property of HRT surface is that it is a, maxim, uh, it is a maximum in timeline direction. So as you deform this gamma A in the timeline direction, its area will decrease. So you can prove that there always exists one such piecewise extremal surface which has smaller area than gamma A. Then by this definition, you will find a non-trivial uh, constrained extremal surface, which is like the piecewise extremal surface here, okay? So when A and R have overlap, in general, you have that the area of this uh, constrained extremal surface is less or equal to gamma A. And when do, uh, when do we have an equality? So we only have an equality when gamma A and gamma R intersect with each other. So in that case, the two surfaces uh, collapse into one surface. So this is the definition of the constrained extremal surface in the bulk. Any questions? Uh, yeah, one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said that uh, you're considering, you're restricting to piecewise extremal surfaces, right? Exactly. Uh, but in the minimization problem, could there be like a, another solution which is not piecewise extremal but is globally ex extremal? Globally extremal. Um, extremal the, the original. Yeah. No, but another one that uh, intersects. 
I'm just asking about somehow uniqueness of the definition you have over there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, if the surface is globally extremal, it will just be this HRT surface, right? Otherwise, you, yeah, you can have, you can have several uh, globally extremal surfaces like the HRT surface, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think. I don't think I see what you mean is like in some sense globally extremal, but still intersecting. So globally right, 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 right. I don't even know. Is that well defined to ask that? Maybe it's not. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, now let's turn to some new definitions on the boundary, which is, uh, I think, is simpler. Okay. Uh, uh, first, I will say that. Here I only define in two plus one dimension, like what I said, but uh, the definition is in general, in general dimension, so you can generalize it. So the boundary, we define some quantity which is uh, called the modular minimal entropy. How do we define it? Uh, so given the state psi and the reduced density matrix rho r, we can evolve the state as the following. So we evolve it like just it's the modular flow on r or, or equivalently said we, we are evolving the state using the modular Hamiltonian of r. So this psi sr is equal to rho r to the isr times psi. For each such modular evolved state psi sr, we can then calculate the entanglement entropy of boundary region A. So we will denote that quantity as S A rho S R. Okay. When S is when S R is equal to zero, we simply get the entanglement entropy of A. How do we define the modular minimal entropy? We define it as the minimum of this quantity. So we minimize over the modular parameter S R, and we find the minimum, which is called the modular minimal entropy here. We can also look at two distinct situations. Uh, the first situation is that A and R do not overlap with each other. So in this case, any modular flow you do on, on the region R will not affect the reduced density matrix on A. So in this case, the minimization is trivial and you simply find the modular minimal entropy is equal to the entanglement entropy. However, when A and R have overlap, by definition, you will have this uh, inequality because the modular flow on R will act non-trivially on A. So you have this uh, inequality. Sorry, but how, how do you know it's almost less than? Sorry? Uh, why is SR almost less than equal to Oh, SA? because when SR is equal to zero, it is SA, and you are trying to find the minimum of this quantity. So the minimum is necessarily smaller than some value of it, right? So here, if you set SR equals to zero, you get SA. Is that clear? Yeah, that, that is clear, yeah. yes. Yes, and the minimum over SR, so the minimum should be less or equal to this quantity, right? Right, but could, could it not be that the unitary, so this rho, um, the, the, the modular flow is generated by unitary, but that unitary could be disentangling, right? I mean, it could just remove it. So in that case, you would start with the highest entanglement entropy, and then, I mean, it could just be removing entanglement from the region A, right? Is, is that not possible? Uh, I mean, well, why is it that it always just adds entanglement? No, no, no. Here it decreases the entanglement, not add, adding the in entanglement, right? Because the, Modular evolved entanglement entropy is less or equal to SA. So it is decreasing the final no, definition. I said add in the sense because you have a minimum there, right? So if SA has to be the minimum, then along the modular flow, entanglement has to increase, right? Is that what you're saying? Or, but why? I mean, is, is there any statement about what should happen to the entanglement entropy along the modular flow? I see, I see. You are saying that if you imagine a case that SA is already a minimum, then you can only increase it in, instead of decreasing. Is, is that what you are trying to say? I mean, I was reading that as what you are trying to say. But maybe you're saying something else. I mean, 
Okay, but could you could you just uh, so yeah, how, I would hit it. So why does it say the maximum here? No. So you start from uh, for SI equals to zero. You you simply have the SA, and then when you do the modular flow, you can either increase the entanglement entropy or decrease the entanglement entropy. Yeah, but right. we are trying to find the minimum of that modular evolved entropy. If you decrease it, then the minimum would be less than SA. Right? Oh, but yeah, in that case, you're saying it's not a tight thing. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's good. That's good. Okay, so um, now that we've already defined the constrained extremal surface in the bulk and the modular, modular minimal entropy on the boundary, we are ready to state our proposal. But let's first look at the simplex case, which is the case that the bulk is two plus one dimensional and A is a single interval. Uh, and in this talk, I will always take R to be a single interval. And there are some comments on the case that R, is a, R contains multiple intervals that is in our paper, but I won't discuss that. And in, under this case that A is a single interval, we have the following equality. So, I, so the modular minimal entropy is equal to the area of the constrained extremal surface divided by 40 Newton. For the cases that A consists of multiple intervals or the higher dimensional case, I will comment on it later. So let's first try to understand this equality. Before we try to uh, provide evidence for that equality, let's first uh, look at some simple checks. So we can do some simple uh, consistency check for the case that we have a time reflection of symmetric state, which is just the RT situation. As we already discussed, so in the RT situation, in the bulk, all the extremal surface lie in the same slice. So when A and R have overlap, gamma A and gamma R intersect with each other. As I said that in this case, the constrained extremal surface will simply be the gamma A here. Because how do you find the constrained extremal surface here? You have this, uh, this surface which is extremal entirely in the bulk, and you can also try to find this piecewise uh, extremal surface, right? But by the RT, uh, RT pro proposal, this gamma A should, should be the one that has minimal area on this slice. So the gamma A will simply be the constrained extremal surface here. So you see that uh, they are equal. And on the boundary, you can calculate the derivative with respect to this parameter S at S equal to zero using the so-called entanglement first law. So when you uh, calculate that, you find that the derivative is equal to the expectation value of the commutator of two modular Hamiltonians. So you have this kind of formula. Then, um, then we are trying to argue that this is zero using the time reflection of symmetry of this state. How do we do that? So we can denote there's a time reversal operator in the boundary theory, which we denote as T. So T is an anti-unitary operator. And since psi is invariant under T, the modular Hamiltonian Ka and Kr are also invariant under T. And one can show that uh, based on these, in fact, the commutator will be time reflectional odd. So this, this expectation value will be zero. Then we can find that uh, S equals zero is in fact uh, in extremal. Then by our following discussion, we will, uh, we will show that it is in fact a minimal. So in the reflectional symmetry case, our proposal in fact reduces to the RT proposal. Uh, because the constrained extremal surface is, in, uh, is simply the RT surface, and also the uh, entanglement entropy is a local minimum with respect to the modular flow. So let's discuss some cases which are non-trivial. And uh, to begin, we can look at the cases when the modular Hamiltonian is an integral of local stress tensor. So this can happen for like spherical subregions for a CFT in the vacuum state, or if we consider the two-sided black hole case and we consider the right region. So the, the, in the two-sided black hole case, the modular Hamiltonian of the right region is simply the Hamiltonian. So it generates time translation. In these cases, the modular flow is a geometrical flow in the bulk, which in fact looks like a boost transformation around the HRT surface. 
since we have a nice understanding of the bulk pictures for the modular evolved states, like precise SR, and uh, we can just check the proposal explicitly. So here I will talk about the two-sided vector case because I think these are familiar to most of you and it can be more illuminating. So more specifically, we are considering the thermal field double state um, defined on some time t. So this is the state, uh, which can be represented using this figure, right? Uh, so in this figure, uh, this figure is supposed to be two plus one dimensional. So I only draw two dimension on, on this screen but you should imagine that at every point on this figure, you have an infinite line which, is, uh, which extends perpendicular to the screen. So each point is an infinite line, half is inside the screen, which I will denote as S less than zero, and half is outside the screen, which I will denote as S greater than zero. And I will take the union of the S greater than zero parts of L and R to be region A. So the region A is something outside the screen, okay. And then at time t, so we are looking at some time slice here, the entanglement entropy of region A is computed by re this red surface here, which is this gamma A. So this is a surface that extends into the horizon, right? As we evolve into the future, the surface of uh, the area of the, this surface will grow linearly with time. This is due to the growth of the length uh, of this wormhole. On the other hand, the entanglement entropy of R is simply calcul calculated by the horizon area, gamma R here. So although in this figure, gamma R is drawn as a point, it is in fact an infinite line which extend perpendic uh, extends perpendicular to the screen. Right? So it is uh, located at the bifurcation surface. Now let's look at the constrained extremal surface. So the constrained extremal surface is uh, given by the purple line here, which locates entirely at x equals to zero. So it locates in the screen and it intersects with this gamma r here. Why is this the uh, constrained extremal surface? First, uh, these two pieces are extremal. And then it's the area of this surface is smaller than the area of the HRT surface. Because if we deform the HRT surface in the time-like direction, it reduces its area. So this, the area of this surface is smaller than the HRT surface. Okay, so uh, how to think about the modular minimal entropy in this figure? Why do we consider this case? Because this case is uh, particularly easy for us to think about that. The modular flow on R is simply a time evolution on the right side. Uh, yeah, so because the modular Hamiltonian is, the, is simply the Hamiltonian of the right system. So for the modular evolved state psi SR, we can think of it as evolving this time slice down here, right? But keeping the left system unchanged. So we can just interpret this psi SR as defined on these two times. Uh, the left time is due on time t, but the right time is shifted by SR. And then the entropy SA of this new state is calculated using the new HRT surface, which should be homologous to the new uh, boundary region A. So it is calculated using this red line here. So this is the new HRT surface that corresponds to this modular evolved entropy. So now know that in the figure, the, the area of the, this red line is still greater than the purple line. How do we see that? We can add a line here, add a dashed line here. So the, the length of this dashed line is equal to the length of this purple solid line, right? Because uh, on the right side, this geometric flow is uh, generated by a killing, killing vector. So it is a symmetry of the space time. <coughs> And we can comp compare the, the area of this red line and the area of this purple line plus this purple dotted, uh, purple, uh, dotted line. So because this red line is an HRT surface, by deforming it in time-like direction, it reduces its area. So we know that the area of the red line is greater than the area of this purple line plus this 
purple dotted line. Then we know that the area of this red line is greater than the, the original purple line, which is the constrained extremal surface. However, the length of the red line will be minimized when, it, when, t become, uh, when we evolve it to minus t. So when we evolve it to this point, the, the new red line will intersect with gamma r. And when this happens, its length will be equal to the length of the purple line. And if you evolve further, uh, it will again be non-intersect. It will not intersect with gamma r anymore. It will be some surface like this. And its area will be greater than the area of uh, the purple surface again. So you find that the minimum of the length of the red surface is at this point, and it equals to the area of the purple line. This simply tells us that uh, the modular minimal entropy is equal to the area of the constrained extremal surface divided by 4G Newton. So is there any question uh, regarding this example? Is it clear? Clear. OK. Uh, so this is the case using the thermal field double state. And uh, for other cases that uh, the modular Hamiltonian is local, we can also uh, present the similar arguments. So I will turn to something which is uh, more non-trivial. Because uh, in general, the modular flow can be very complicated. And in fact, it can be a non-local operator in the bulk. However, we can still make some progress in two plus one dimensional case. So first we look at the bulk. We start from a formula from a paper by Tom Faulkner and Ito Lukwitz in the 17, and we express, uh, which expresses the modular zero mode of a boundary operator O as an integral of operators on the HRT surface. So let me explain the, the formula here. So on the left hand side, this OX is some boundary operator. And you, you evolve it using the modular Hamiltonian of R like this. So this, I, I will say this is the modular evolved operator. And then you integrate over this modular parameter as here. So why, why do we call this, uh, this whole operator the modular zero mode? This is because after you integrate uh, over this uh, modular parameter S, this new operator will be invariant under further modular flow. So if you, modular, uh, you, if you do any modular flow of this operator, it will just go back to itself. So we call it the modular zero mode. Well, on the other hand, so on the right hand side of the uh, equation, you have some number, which is the bulk to boundary propagator here. So phi z is an operator located on the HRT surface. And phi z o x is the bulk to boundary propagator. So you, you simply have some inter, integration over the HRT surface and the, the operators all locate on that surface. So why should we expect such a formula to be true? This is basically based on the equivalence of boundary and bulk modular flow. So the left hand side is invariant under the boundary modular flow on R, while the right hand side, because all the operator locates on the HRT surface, and the HRT surface is the fixed point of the modular flow on R. We have that the right hand side is invariant under the bulk modular flow. So uh, this is an intuitive way to understand this formula. Of course, you should also look at their paper to understand it, the derivation. And let's first uh, accept this formula and we insert this formula into a two point function on the boundary. So we insert some other operator where well, I, I denote as OX here, and here is OY. So by inserting this uh, boundary operator, one gets that uh, the right-hand side is a product of two bulk to boundary propagators, right? integrated over the HRT surface gamma R. Now for our purpose, we will consider the operators which have dimensions uh, much greater than one, so it is a heavy operator. But we will keep the ratio of the dimension uh, and the central charge to be much less than one. So we can neglect the back reaction of this operator at leading order in the large C expansion. In these cases, we can use the geodesic approximation. So the left hand side, we keep it unchanged, 
while we use the geodesic approximation for the right hand side the propagator the bulk to boundary propagator we can write it as e to the minus delta times the geodesic length from z to x and similar for this term is uh, geodesic length from z to y and since we are integrating over the hrt surface we should have an integral over z here but we the the integral will be dominated by some maximum of that integral. So we can approximate the right hand side as the maximum <coughs> uh, when Z is in the HRT sur sur surface gamma R and we are maximizing this quantity here. Okay, so uh, here I've already taken the op one operator to be in the region left and the other to be in the region right. So the left is simply the complement of R. And the right hand side, we will see that it is in fact related to the constrained extremal surface that I just defined. Because you have a maximum here, which you can just take the minimum of this exponent, right? So uh, you will find the minimum over this uh, HRT surface is in fact just the, the constrained extremal surface. When you take x and y to be the boundary of A, right? So if you take x and y to be the two boundary points of A, uh, and then you take a minimization over the HRT surface, you will simply find the area of the constrained extremal surface. On the other hand, we expect that the integral on the left hand side to be dominated by some zero point. So we can approximate it at, at some zero point value you have some special value of SR here. If we accept this, then by equating the two right-hand sides, we get that the settle point value of this, in fact, four-point function is approximately the maximization over this quantity. So here, the settle point approximation seem a little unjustified, but uh, this result is, in fact, made more precise in the paper which appeared at the same time of our paper by Tom Faulkner, M. Lee, and uh, Hua Jia Wang. So in their paper, the geometrical meaning of SR star here is also discussed, which fits quite well with our proposal. But uh, in, uh, in my talk, I will not go into detail of their paper. So how do we relate these results to the modular minimal entropy? The trick is to view the two operators, OSL and OYR here, to be the twist operators on the two endpoints of region A. So we take OXL to be the twist operator on, on the left, on the boundary of A that is located in L region, and we take OYR to be another twist operator which locates in the R region. With no modular flow, the entropy of A is calculated using the replica trick with replica index N here, so N is also here. So you can basically uh, express the entanglement entropy as a two-point function of the twist operator, and then you take derivative with respect to the uh, uh, replica trick index n, and then you take n equals to one. So the scaling dimension of the twist operator is like this. So it scales as c. So as we first take the large c limit, it will be a very heavy operator. But when we take the limit that n goes to one, its ratio uh, of delta divided by c will be goes to uh, will be going to zero. So it we can view the twist operator as a non-back reacting operator. So we can use the uh, previous geodesic approximation for such operator. This is the expression for the entanglement entropy. While if we have some modular flow on the region R, this form this formula can be generalized into this formula. So you basically inserted two modular flow uh, unitary operator here. This formula is similar to the case that we are considering um, the change of entanglement under a time evolution or the change of entanglement after a quench, uh, uh, such things like that. So we have such a formula, which look very much like what we are discussing here. So as we have this formula, the modular minimal entropy is given by the minimum of such quantity. Right. Then, uh, then as we take the minimum, we are actually taking the maximum of this uh, commutator here. And then we find 
this is simply just the wall what I discussed as here, right? We take the maximum of this quantity and the way uh, is equal to this, this special point of SR star. So it's dominated by this point. And we have that the modular minimal entropy is given by this formula. Then by using the previous uh, equation, this equation here, and related to the constrained extremal surface, we get this formula. So the modular minimal entropy can be expressed geometrically. Then we find it is simply the uh, C divided by six times the, uh, the area of the constrained extremal surface. Another way to express it is simply the constrained extremal surface divided by 40 Newton. So in the case that the modular flow is non-local, we uh, used these arguments to show that so you have a question. No. Oh, no, 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 So, uh, in the case that the modular flow is non local, uh, we used these arguments to show that the min modular minimal entropy is equal to the, the area of the constrained extremal surface divided by Fortune Newton. <clears throat> now, let's turn to some situations that are more complicated. So, uh, things become harder when A consists of multiple regions. Uh, why do we have subtleties in these cases? So let's, let me first state the conclusion. So when A consists of multiple regions, we do not in general have an equality. Instead, we expect that we have an inequality like this. So the modular minimal entropy is greater than or equal to the, the constrained extremal surface. I won't go into full discussion of this inequality, but I will illustrate it using an example. Again, using the thermal field double state. So in this case, the, uh, so this figure is a side view of the two-sided black hole. And so I take the, <coughs> I take the left region to be on the time slice t equals zero, but I take the right, right region to be at some boosted region, right? Boosted region here. So uh, A divides into two parts. A left is entirely on the time x to zero slice, but the uh, right part of A is boosted. So one end of it, it, one end of it is at time x to minus time t zero, and the other end of it is at uh, t equals to t zero. So it is a boosted region. In this case, the uh, constrained extremal surface is again the purple surface here, like this. But uh, as in our argument, when we are trying to find the modular minimal entropy, we are trying to move this AR up and down, right, using the Hamiltonian of the right system. But as we move it up and down, we cannot really find the moment that the new HRT surface, which corresponds to the modular minimal entropy, has the same area as this constrained extremal surface. And in fact, we will have that the minimum of that uh, modular evolved entropy, which is the modular minimal entropy here, is greater than the, the area of the constrained extremal surface. Geometrically, this is re re related to the fact that the constrained extremal surface has two different boost angles across gamma r. So here, the boost angle is the, basically the kink angle as we across gamma r. And here the boost angle is this, while here the boost angle is something different. So this is geometrically related to the fact that we do not have an equality here. Another perspective that uh, using what I just discussed is that uh, the, the area of the constrained minimal surface is the result of maximizing the following expression. So it's a, it's, a maxim, uh, it's a maximization of the following expression with S1 and S2 independent of each other. Basically, you are, uh, this surface is a result of maximizing, uh, maximizing this object, while this surface is the result of maximizing this object. And S1 and S2 are independent of each other. However, when we are trying to calculate the modular minimal entropy using this formula, we are trying to make, minimize it under the constraint that S1 equals to S2. This is because on the, 
on, in the definition of the modular minimal entropy, we have only one modular parameter S, and we are, we are actually minimize, uh, minimizing it under the constraint that S1 equals to S2 here. So since the minimization of this uh, modular minimal entropy is more constrained, we necessarily have this inequality. So again, this inequality, when do we have the equality? The equality holds only when the boost angles are the same. That means that uh, when we here, when we maximize it with S1 and S2 independent, if the boost angles are the same, the maximum point will be located at S1 equals to S2. This is another perspective to see why we have an inequality instead of equality here. So as a summary, in two plus one dimension, even when the modular flow is non-local, we are actually able to show that for general uh, regions A, we have the following, following inequality. So on the left, this is simply the HRT proposal. And then we have the entanglement entropy is greater than the modular minimal entropy by our definition. And the modular minimal entropy is then greater or equal to the area of the constrained extremal surface. Um, when the modular flow is non-local, we can also uh, prove this using some results that I already mentioned earlier. It's in this paper, which appeared at the same time of our paper. So again, when uh, the second inequality, when do we have an equality here? So I, I think I have a typo, typo here. So we have an equality here only when gamma RA has constant boost angles across gamma R by using their results. In higher dimension, we conjecture this uh, expression to be true, but uh, we do not in general have a proof or disprove. Now we, can, we are ready to answer the questions that I uh, mentioned in the motivation part. So when gamma A and gamma R, when they can be put in the same slides, we have that the constrained extremal surface is, is equal to the extremal surface. And because they are equal to each other by this inequality, on the boundary, we, we must have that SA is equal to this modular minimal entropy. So this is a sign that, is, that tells us that gamma A and gamma R can be put in the same slides. But if the modular minimal entropy is smaller than the entanglement entropy, by this equality, inequality, we know that gamma A and gamma R cannot be put in the same slides. So these two points answer the question that I raised in the motivation part of the talk. Okay, so now let's, let me uh, spend the, net, the rest of the time to look at some simple examples. So in gravity, an interesting example of time-dependent geometry is the Vaidya geometry, which describes the process of matter collapsing and forming a black hole. We will dis discuss the constrained extremal surface in, the, in this case, the main point of this discussion is to show you some real examples that how, how do the constrained extremal surface really look like? Because so far I've only shown you some cartoons. <clears throat> By the holographic duality, uh, this case should also tell us how the modular minimal entropy changes during the process of thermalization in the holographic CFT. Beyond holographic theories, the modular minimal entropy is also an interesting object to study because it is a new object that we propose, which has not been discussed before. However, it is in, in general very difficult to calculate. To gain some simple intuition, we will study the free fermion system in which we can calculate it sim simpler. So the gravity example is the Vedia geometry. Uh, the Vedia geometry describes the process of matter collapsing and forming of a black hole. And we will consider the two plus one dimensional case with the metric as the following. So here is a picture for the bulk. On the left hand side, on the left side, we have the R equals to zero. And on the right side, we have R goes to infinity. So this is the center of the bulk, excuse me. <coughs> and this is the boundary of the bulk. This red thing is a infalling shell which is the collapsing of the matter here. And this blue dotted line is the horizon. So it merges from the shell and it becomes a, a, some constant value of R. Okay, 
So when V is smaller than zero, we have a pure ideal three metric, which is on this region of the bulk. While when V is greater than zero, we have a BTZ black hole metric, which is on this region of the bulk. A generic edge hard heat surface in this uh, picture will be extended into the interior of the shell in some early time, and its area will grow linearly during the thermalization. So you can imagine we pick some time slice here, and then the HRT surface will extend into the shell. So it experiences some early part of the geometry, which is pure idea three. And at, let, at late time, the whole HRT surface will be located in the BTZ part. So after that time, which is usually longer for larger region, the HRT surface will be entirely in the BTZ geometry and its area remains unchanged. Since at early time and late time the geometry is, is static, the constrained surface gamma Ra coincides with the HRT surface gamma A, and one has that their, uh, the difference of their length is zero. However, during intermediate time, during the thermalization process, this difference will first increase and then decrease. So here I show you some real example of how they look like. This is the case where uh, the size of A is smaller than the size of R. So let me explain the figure here. So the blue cylinder is ADA3, uh, which I map it, map it into a finite region. And the orange shell here is the infalling matter. Okay. So I'm picking some uh, boundary time slice, which is denoted by this yellow circle here. And the blue line here corresponds to the HRT surface for the boundary region A, while the black line here corresponds to the HRT surface fund for the boundary region R. So this is gamma A and this is gamma R. So in this case, the HRT surface has a, has a kink when it extends into the shell because the, the derivative the metric is not continuous there. So uh, we can calculate the constrained extremal surface in this case and we find it to be this union of the red line and the green line. So the left figure corresponds to some earlier time in which both the HRT surface of A and R extend into the shell. While on the right, we have some later time, so the HRT surface of the boundary region A already comes out of the shell and locates entirely in the BTZ part of the geometry. So in these two figures, one thing that you can see is that gamma R gamma R and, and the constrained extremal surface are somehow in the future of the surface gamma A. What do I mean by in the future here? I mean, I can pick a Cauchy slice which contains the surface gamma A, and then the uh, constrained extremal surface and the extremal surface gamma R are located uh, entirely in the future of that Cauchy slice. So in these two figure, I can do that. And the case when the size of A is equal to the size of R, since we have a spatial Z2 symmetry that can swamp A and R, gamma R and gamma A will always be intersecting in the bulk and we have the, the constrained extremal surfaces is just trivial as the gamma A. Now let's look at the case that uh, the size of A is greater than the size of R. So in this case, um, again, I pick some early time that the two HRT surface are both, uh, both extend into the shell, while in the right figure, I consider some late time that the HRT surface of R already comes out of the shell. But in these two figures, we find something different, that is the gamma R and the constrained extremal surface are in the past of gamma A instead of in the future. So, whether it is in the past or in the future seems to depend on the size, the relative size of the two regions. So this is the case of the Vedia geometry. And then I will show you uh, how the modular minimal entropy behaves in the other case, which is not a holographic system. So we investigated the behavior of a modular minimal entropy for a free fermion system under a quench. More specifically, we consider a one-dimensional tight binding model with periodicity L, so this is a tight bounding model defined on the circle. And this is the tight bounding Hamiltonian. And we quench the system at time equals zero by adding a so-called stagger potential. So the potential here is like this. Uh, Ni is the fermion number defined on each side. 
and you have this uh, uh, this changing sign or uh, depending on which side you are on and this uh, we only add this add this term after time equals to zero so initially we will put the system in the ground state that is half field and physically what this stack of potential uh, do is to open up a gap in the spectrum and gives the fermion an effective mass. So after the quench, you will find that the entanglement of your small region in fact grows and then reaches an equilibrium. Here I show you the, an example. So this is the entanglement of, of uh, subregion A. We see that after time equals zero, it grows and then it saturates at some point. However, because this is a free fermion system, so this saturation will be only uh, of, of order at as the size of the system instead of uh, exponentially in the size of the system because it is an uh, integrable system. So since the system obeys the weak theorem, sorry, since the system obeys the weak theorem, the reduced density matrix is fully determined by the two-point function of the fermion operators. And we can use this to calculate the entanglement. <laughs> Um, in this case, this is true, still true for the modular evolved states. Why? Because the modular Hamiltonian of some region R is also a quadratic operator in the Fermi operators. So using it to, uh, to do time evolution, the, the, the result of that time evolution, the state will still obey the weak theorem. So this procedure still works. So in this case, we can simply calculate the uh, modular minimal entropy quite easily. And here is the case when the size of A is smaller than the size of R. Let me explain the figure here. What is the figure? So the left figure is, uh, is the, at time equals to zero. So it is before the quench. And the horizontal axis is the modular evolving uh, parameter SR here. And the, the, the curve corresponds to the modular evolved entanglement entropy of A. Now, as we see, it has some minimum here at, as, at modular, uh, and modular parameter s equal to zero. But because the Fermion system is uh, some integrable system, this, this curve will in fact has some periodicity. So it has some other minimum at some larger s parameter here. But we will mainly be interested in this local minimum. And we see that at time equals zero, the local minimum as, is at s equal to zero as expected. While at some finite time, the minimum is shifted uh, to some positive S value, and the, the value of the minimum is also shifted. So we can plot the change of, so this delta SA is uh, the difference between the entanglement entropy and the modular minimal entropy. As we see that the difference grows and then drops to zero as the system goes into some quasi-static phase. While also the, the place that we reach the minimum in this figure, so I denote the place that we reach the minimum as S mean. So S mean also grows with time and then drops to zero. It has some uh, oscillation here because the, the system that I'm considering has a finite bandwidth, so it has some uh, oscillation here. As we uh, see in this example, actually, the sign of this S mean will depend on the relative sign, size of A and R. So from the left to the right, I plot three cases. One is uh, for three different uh, relative size. So in one case, it is positive. And for the case that the two regions have the same size, it remains zero because the minimum will always be located as, as, at S equals zero. And in the third case, you have that S mean is in fact negative. So we will conjecture that there is a relation between the sign of S mean on the boundary and the causal relation between the three surfaces in the time direction, as I've uh, mentioned in the case of the Vedia geometry. <clears throat> this uh, conjecture can be verified in the case of local modular flows, but we do not really have a proof for in general. Okay, so now I'll summar summarize. So first, uh, we defined the constrained extremal surface um, in the bulk and the modular minimal entropy on the boundary. We, we proposed this quantity tr to try to answer the question that when do two HRT surfaces lie in the same bulk slice? 
In two plus one dimension, and when A and R are both single intervals, we showed the equality between the two quantities. So we showed that the modular minimal entropy is equal to the area of the constrained extremal surface divided by four G Newton. In more general situations, we in fact expect an inequality as the following. So there are many open questions to answer. So for example, uh, basically we only have proofs of our proposal in two plus one dimension, but uh, we in general do not really know whether our conjecture holds in higher dimension and it, it would be nice to have a proof or a disproof. Uh, also, our whole discussion is in the leading order of the large N expansion. So it, it would be nice to understand the quantum corrections of our proposal. Also, it, it would be nice to understand the relation of our proposal to other different proposals for understanding the emergence of the time in holographic duality. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm done here. Thanks, Yiming. Um, we had quite a few questions already. Does anybody have any further questions? Yeah, well, so, I have one question about the title. Because you called the Mojai Hamiltonian a disentangler. Yes. And I don't understand the word disentangler because the modular, the minimum modular entropy, it's true, you're defining it as the minimum. So of course you're gonna find, it's gonna look like a disentangler for that specific S min, I think you call it, mm -hmm. for that modular time. But generically, uh, away from that modular time, this could be maximized. I mean, it could be increased. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, could you clarify this? This yes, yes. Let me clarify. It. Yes, you are. You are totally correct. And uh, the title, so modular flow in general can be a distinguisher, or it can also increase the entanglement. But why do we uh, use this title? It, this title means that when we, when the modular flow serves as a disentangler, it has some nice, uh, nice role in the holographic duality. So it has some correspondent in the bulk. However, in, in general, the modular, uh, the entanglement should be after a modular flow will not have a bulk correspondence, right? So here we are simply saying that when modular flow is a distinct is a distinct tangular, it has a bulk correspondence. So we're not saying it is always a distinct tangular. And uh, can can you remind us about like uh, how how the how the lessons from Vedia compared to the quantum free fermions? Oh no, uh, they are not related. Yeah. No, no, I, I understand. But like, were there some similarities, or it's uh, it was just an exercise to 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 calculate uh, this quantity in in another setting? Yeah, in the free fermion case, we basically we simply want to have a concrete calculation of this modular minimal entropy in the boundary system, uh, except uh, from the holographic CFTs. Also, you, you basically were, I mean, like the, 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 the common theme between this and Vedia was just that you had a time dependence and, uh, and, and that's it. Um, yes, 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 yes. If you compare it to Vedia, then I think the, it's only the time dependence look, look qualitatively similar. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, sure. Good. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>